and welcome to another week of classes. We are now starting chapter 10. I want to start by thanking those of you who were so prompt and efficient in turning in your tests. I'm hoping to have those grades up on Blackboard for you um, by Monday evening or Tuesday mid-afternoon at the absolute latest, but I'm hoping for Monday evening um, if I can do, if I have no other interruptions. There's so much else going on, right? Um, other than that, we are now in the home stretch. This is our last unit before we start prepping for our finals. So congratulations for sticking with it and making it through despite the challenges that have been thrown at you for this semester. All right, without further ado, let me uh, screen share here so that you can see my notes for section 10.1 where we are starting today. Alrighty, and let me pull those notes up for you. Here we go. So chapter 10 is dedicated to looking at statistics, which is the last basic concept of math that you as an elementary school teacher need to be aware of, to do well in and be able to present to your students because the most simplest concepts of statistics are introduced as early as third grade. So you do have to be aware of it and uh, know how to discuss it, uh, talk about it, and um, obviously present it in a well thought out manner. And it's also an extremely useful thing to know and understand because we are, have statistics thrown at us daily. We are bombarded with that information on a regular basis. And you need to understand where it comes from, how it's collected, why it's displayed, the manner in which it is displayed, whether it's a bar graph, um, a pie chart, or any of the other forms um, of displaying statistics that we're going to discuss, and how to read those, how to understand them, and where this data is coming from and how to interpret it. So that's what we're gonna dedicate chapter 10 to. Chapter section uh, 10.1, which is what we're gonna to discuss today, is gonna to basically just introduce us to statistics, how to approach a statistical problem, and some basic formats used to display and analyze data that has been collected, okay? So for topic one, we're gonna start with the steps to statistical problem solving. Very much like when we talked about polio steps for problem solving way back at the beginning of the semester, we have some steps here that we can use to address problem solving when we are specifically um, setting out to do so by using statistics, okay? So you can see here that Steps of statistical problem solving is the process for solving problems involving statistical data, and it requires the following information. It requires that you formulate a question that can be addressed with data, collect the data, organize the data, display the relevant data in such a way that you can then answer the question that you formulated. And then when you are selecting how to analyze and display the data. You have to make sure that you select and use appropriate statistical methods to analyze the data that you're looking at. And this, of course, depends on the kind of data that you collect. And there are two basic types of data that is collected and analyzed. One is quantitative data, which is, I'm sorry, I think that's backwards. Is it quantitative? quantitative. Sorry, one is qualitative data, and these are backwards. Um, so please switch these in your notes. Do not follow these notes here. I will have to correct them immediately as soon as we're done with the video. But we have quantitative data and qualitative data. Quantitative data is the um, objective, measurable, and numerical data that can be collected that you can, uh, for example, if we want to know how many people live in a particular area, how many male versus females, um, heights of students at particular ages, um, hair color, eye color, these are all things that can be measured and are objective and don't have to do with the person taking the, 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 the data it has nothing to do with their opinion. It also doesn't have to do with the opinion of the people or individuals from whom the data is being collected. So it's objective, it's measurable and numerical. This right here, please, this is the definition for quantitative data. Qualitative data, where you can kind of hear quality is in that word. Qualitative data 
this is the definition for it. It is subjective. It's usually done in categories and it has to do with the opinions or the feelings of the individuals from whom you're collecting the data. For example, qualitative data is things like um, favorite sports car, um, favorite sports team, the favorite ice cream flavor that you have. Um, fashion trends and things of that nature can be considered qualitative data because it basically is subjective to the opinion of the individuals whom you are collecting the data from. Okay, and again, I will correct this humongous error. My deepest apologies, I don't really know how that happened. Um, but again, this right here, objective, measurable, numerical, that is the definition of quantitative data and subjective and categories is the definition of qualitative data and I will be correcting that immediately. All right, so depending on which of those two types of data you're collecting, whether quantitative or qualitative, then that is going to influence the appropriate statistical methods that you use to analyze it and the way in which you choose to organize it and display it. So it is all affected by the type of data that you're collecting, okay? So step number one in solving problems, statistical problems, is to formulate the questions, right? Now these questions are usually formulated from the context that we encounter in daily life. So for example, a question like, how many siblings do most third graders have? That is a question that could be answered statistically, right? You would take a survey, you would find out, and you'd be able to analyze that data. A good way to know whether or not the questions you're asking are appropriate questions to help you answer a statistical problem is that formulated questions for for statistical problem, or as we like to call them, statistics questions, usually answer the following. How many? How big? Which is the fastest, the tallest, the largest? So when you're answering those kinds of questions, you are answering statistic questions. These are questions that are answered through statistical data collection and analysis, okay? Now, the step two is then once you've formulated this question and you realize that in order to answer it, you need to collect data and then be able to analyze it, that's step two, collect the data. And there are two main aspects that have to be considered when you are collecting data. You need to consider what data you need to collect and how you're going to collect it. Because first of all, they influence each other, okay? The data that you're going to collect influences the way in which you're going to collect it. And how you collect the data influences the kind of data you're going to collect. So they are dovetailed, they go hand in hand, and they influence one another, which is why this statement here is starred for you. What data you collect influences how you collect it. But how do you collect it? Well, some basic ways are usually from observations or from surveys. Um, observations can include just observing what's happening as well as collecting actual data like going in and measuring. You know, measurement is the third possible way of collecting data. So we've got observations, surveys, measurements, okay? What kind of data are we collecting? Well, it depends on what you're hoping to find. We normally have what's called a population that we're getting the data from. Okay, a population in statistics specifically refers to the entire group that you are hoping to get information from. So for example, if I want to know um, the pregnancy rates of women in the United States, that's the population that I'm hoping to get data from. But because that's such a large population and it would be logistically impossible for me to accurately question all women um, of childbearing age in the United States, all over the different geographical areas that our country covers, then I might not be able to actually um, get data from the population that I'm hoping to get data from. So what we do is we take what's called a sample and sample data and population data are different which is why you need to know what data you're collecting. So what I would do is I would get sample of that population. Now the sample is defined as being carefully chosen from the population that you're hoping to get information from. You need to make sure that it is representative of that population so that your sample contains all the possible variables that exist in the actual population that you're hoping to analyze data from. And then you collect the data that you were hoping to collect from that sample and analyze that sample data. Now, 
sample data can be analyzed in some in very similar ways that population data is analyzed from, but it is important to know whether you're looking at sample data or population data because it has different levels, margin of errors, and, and different levels of veracity. So that's why it is important to know what data you're collecting. Is it sample data or population data? And then how you collect it. Um, because if you're collecting sample data, you might do so in a different manner than you might do population data. Okay, population data, you would have to maybe do massive surveys, whereas if you have a sample, maybe you're gonna sit down and do individual interviews. So it depends on what type of data you are using to determine what collection methods you would use, okay? Finally, step three is now you've collected your data, right? You, you formulated the question you want to answer, you've collected the data, you've determined whether you have a sample data or population data, you've determined how you collected that data, whether it was a survey, whether it was observations, whether it was measurements or interviews, and now you need to take all this data that you've collected and you need to organize it, display it, and analyze it, right? So the first thing you need to do is organize it and then find an effective manner in which to display it. Now we're going to talk about specifics of displaying and organizing data a little bit more when we get to topic two of this section. But for the purposes of discussing the steps that you would use to solve statistical problems, we're just going to say that step three, organizing and displaying data, requires it, it you do it because it facilitates your ability to analyze that data. So organizing it and then choosing an appropriate way of displaying it then makes it easier for you to finally analyze and interpret that data. So that's why we need to do it. And, it. and therefore, organizing and choosing a display method for the data that you've collected in step two enables the answering of the original question that you formulated in step one, right? So finally, we reach step four, which is where we're going to analyze and interpret this data that we've collected, okay? And when we do that, we decide whether or not the things that we looked at, the groups that we looked at, are different from each other or the same from each other and in what way. And we usually do that by determining things like what's the average, what is the distribution of the data. And we're gonna look at that even more closely um, and when we reach the, uh, the other sections of this chapter, because this is also where you might look at things like margin of error and, and you might look at um, z-scores and things like that, which help you to analyze and interpret the data. Um, so we'll look at that a little bit more deeply as we move on. So those are the four steps that you need to solve statistical problems. You need to formulate the question that needs to be answered. You need to determine uh, what kind of data you need to collect. And that when you determine what kind of data you need to collect, that in turn um, influences how you collect the data. Then you need to decide how you're going to organize and display this data. You do that because that allows you to finally analyze and interpret the data that you've collected, okay? All right, let's move on to topic two, organizing and displaying the data. Now, why does this warrant an, a topic all to itself? Because there are a lot of approaches we can use and the approaches we use um, depend on the type of data we collected, like we mentioned before, whether you're looking at quantitative data, which is object, objective and measurable, or whether you're looking at qualitative data, which is subjective and is usually collected in categories, okay? So organizing data, as we said in step three, facilitates the analysis and the reporting of the data that was collected. So we do it and we come up with ways to display it because then it allows us to be able to analyze and interpret the data that we collected in our effort to answer the question that we formulated, right? All right, so the first way that we're gonna look at is line plots. It's one of the simpler ways of looking at sets of data, and it gives you some direct information right away. A line plot right away allows you to know um, which repeated values occurred, okay? And it lets, it lets you see that very quickly, and it's seen very easily. And the best way to look at that is if we look at figure 10.1, which you can find on page 418 of your textbook, uh, line plots can sometimes be called um, dot plots as well. And usually you can do them with dots or X's and those dots and X's correspond to each of the individual values that occur. And the line plot helps you to notice the frequency of those values. Now the frequency is defined as the number of times that a value occurs. So let me pull up this picture here for you so that you can see what we mean when we're talking about a line plot. 
okay? So if you look at that figure that we mentioned in your notes, okay? Here we go. Here is a line plot or a dot plot, okay? This tells us that we're looking at the test scores for a class in science, okay? And so here we have the test scores going along the bottom and up here along what we call the y-axis or going up um, vertically is the frequency. So each individual dot represents a score, but you can very quickly see where they group together and which ones repeated multiple times. So we can see here that this score here, which looks to be about score 20, um, two, I think it is. This looks like score 22, apparently occurred four times. So four students had the score of 22 in this particular science test. Also, we can see right away that it looks like only one student scored up here at a 49, okay? And we only had one student that scored all the way down here at a six. So it allows you to quickly sort of see the spread of the data. It allows you to also very quickly notice where it bunches up together and what values repeat or how, what values have a higher frequency. So for example, 22, we can see that it occurred four times, which is why you can see that it lines up to four, okay? But on the other hand, we can see that the score of 11 occurred only once, okay? And that's both visually, uh, easy to discern by the number of dots, but as well as by reading the axes of the graph. Okay, so hopefully that helps you to understand what a line plot is. Like I said, it could be a dot plot. Here they're using dots. I've seen them when they also just use Xs. But it's a nice, easy way to sort of see the spread of the data, to see where it starts to group together so that we can determine the mean. Again, it's a term we'll discuss a little bit later um, in the next section. And it helps you to see which points occurred more often or have a higher frequency. So it gives you some very uh, quick analysis of the data and it makes it very visually easy to discern, okay? All right, so let's go back to our notes here. All right, so the next thing we have after our uh, line plots is we want to look at what's called stem and leaf plots. Okay, stem and leaf plots is a popular method and it's where the numbers are broken down into tens and ones, the tens being the stems, the ones being the leaves. Now, obviously, because we break things down into tens and ones, you can see that this, it does have a limitation. It's not a useful um, way of displaying and organizing data for all kinds, all sets of data, but it is a popular one because it's simple and like the line plot, very quickly can help you organize the data and you can right away spot some things on that data like um, frequency of values that have occurred as well as noticing you know where it's grouping up more um there are two ways to do it we can take those same science scores that we just looked at on the line plot and we can either look at a regular stem and leaf plot which we're going to look at in figure 10.2 at the bottom of page 418 or we can look at well, for example if we were to take two sets of data representing two different science classes and sort of wanted to see them as they compared to each other, we could do what's called a back-to-back -back and uh, stem and leaf plot. So let me pull that up, that, that you can see um, on table 10.5 at the bottom of page 419. So I'm gonna pull that up for you now so that you can get a look at what that's like. Um, and I hope you're bearing with me as we're switching gears here. Um, if you should need, let me see if I can pull that up here without having to change the screen too much. All right, so here is the data set for a um, for two classes, right, of the science classes. And then here we can see the stem and leaf plot. So here is the first one for just the first class. You'll notice that uh, for those that did not have tens, we have a score of nine and a score of six, okay? And then here with one 10, we had a score of 14, a score of 11, a score of 16, a score of 17, and a score of 18. But it allows you to kind of see where those all group together. Then when we moved into two tens, right, which is the, the, set, the next stem, we see that we had a score of 22, 23, another 22, and 25, 28, two more 22s, 
21, 27, 26, 28, 25. So you can see how that tells you that that's where the largest group of scores lies, right? So it does give you a nice visual representation. You can spot right away where more most of the scores are. Um, I have seen stem and leaf plots where they insist that the, the the leaves be put in um, numerical order. So instead of them being all over the place, we'd want this to be one and then four and then six and seven and eight. So you can very clearly see them lined up in numerical value. They didn't do so for this example, but that's okay. Um, and then here is the example of back to back, right? Where they took the two sets of class data and they share stems. So now you just see the leaves on either side. So here's the original set of leaves we were looking at in table 10.2. And then here are the other set of leaves for the second class, okay? And once again, you can see that the second class, most of their scores concentrated in the 30s. You can also see that for the second class, at least for the 30s, they seem to try to line them up in um, numerical order. I think it looks like they did that for all of them. Whereas you can tell that over here, um, originally they did not, but now it looks like they have put them in numerical order. So you've got 21. You can see that 22 is the one that re repeats the most. I find that it's more useful to do it this way to at least make sure that your leaves are in numerical order. Because again, not only does it visually let you see where the data is grouping, but it also allows you to see it in numerical order and be able to analyze it quickly. Like for example, tell that there are several scores of 22 over here. I can see that there are several, um, a pair of scores at 28 and a pair of 24s, of 34s rather, um, and then a pair of 49s. So that makes it easier to spot them out because you've got the, um, the leaf, leaf section of this stem and leaf plot um, organized in numerical order. Okay. All righty. So, uh, sorry, that was the wrong button to press, yeah? <laughs> Let's go back to the notes and continue. So we just wrapped up stem and leaf plots. So let's move on to histograms. Now, histograms, and as, and as you saw, both line plots, stem and leaf plots, and histograms, these are all methods of organizing and displaying data that would have to have been collected quantitatively or measurably, um, because it would make it difficult to do so if you had categories, things like, for example, uh, how many people like strawberry ice cream? It would be very difficult to report the category of strawberry ice cream in a line plot. Um, although that one might lend itself a little easier than um, your stem and leaf or your histogram. Stem and leaf and histogram very much need it to be quantitative data. Uh, qualitative data like, you know, favorite ice cream flavors are a little easier to be displayed in some of the ways that we're gonna look at in a minute. And you can kind of make a line plot work for you, but it's still not quite as um, useful. It would not be as easily readable either. So the methods that we've discussed so far, line plot, stem and leaf plots, and now histograms are really more suitable for quantitative data, um, i.e. measurable objective data, um, than for qualitative data, okay? Now a histogram, and that's why it's gonna be a nice little transition point here. A histogram is a specialized type of bar graph so um, as you will see in a minute, bar graphs usually are more suitable for qualitative data. That's that data that we is, object, uh, is subjective and that we collect um, in categories, things like uh, you know, favorite ice creams and favorite colors to wear and favorite seasons to live in and things like that. Um, but histograms are a specialized version of a bar graph that is actually specifically suited for qualitative quantitative data, i.e. the objective measurable data, okay? Um, as you can see here, quantitative data. Histograms are defined as data that is grouped into intervals or bins and then plotted according to the frequency of the data values. Um, the best way to discuss this is to look at a histogram. Oh, please excuse me. So I'm going to pull up a histogram for you to look at so that you can uh, get a better idea of what we're talking about here. If we look at this histogram, and let me see if I can slide it up, okay, you'll notice that along here, along the bottom, along what we normally refer to as the x-axis, right, or the input axis, um, 
we have bins or uh, intervals, right? So all the scores from zero to nine would fall in here. And it looks like we have two scores that fall between zero and nine. Again, we're still thinking of this as the data for the science test scores, okay? And that we looked at earlier in the line plot. So, and then here in the next bin, it goes from 10 to 19. Notice that the intervals always have to have the same, num same number a range between them. Um, and then you will notice that the frequency, which is on the y side of the axis, what we call this the y axis or the um, output data, tells us how many scores go in there. So we know that in that data set of science class test scores, we have two scores, because the frequency says two, that fall within the interval of zero to six. Okay. We know that we have approximately five scores, because um, it's between four and six, so approximately five scores in that data set of scores that fall between the interval of 11 to 19, okay? And then so on and so forth. And the bins are always organized from least to greatest, from left to right. And so that's why it's very easy to spot things like your mean, your mode, or your average. Again, things we're gonna discuss a little bit later, but it's very easy to spot them in a histogram. Uh, what, some of the shortcomings are, for example, you don't know what those exact scores are unless you were also accompanied with the full data set that the histogram was created from. Then you could spot some of those things, okay? So this is a histogram, and you, as you can see, it is a specialized bar graph. Please note there's never any spaces between the bars in a histogram, which is one of the specific um, characteristics. And then in a little bit later, we'll talk about a couple more specific characteristics that are different between histograms and regular bar graphs, okay? Okay. Now, let's talk about a regular bar graph, okay? So here we have a regular bar graph, and I'm gonna move me over because I feel like I'm blocking um, the notes here. I don't know if you see it on your end, but it is blocking on my end. All right, so a bar graph is used for qualitative data. This is the subjective data, as I've mentioned before, the one that we usually collect in categories. And a bar graph is specifically defined as a visual way to make comparisons over a period of time. So that is usually um, what we use bar graphs for. because it, it helps us to see how things are marching out over time. But again, if we're looking at just categories, it just helps us also to see how the frequency of who like what category better. So it lends itself to both. Okay, and uh, let's look at two bar graphs. Bar graphs are also useful in the sense that we, it allows us to, to compare more than one set of data on the same display. So we can make comparisons between the two sets of data um, as well, okay? So I'm gonna pull up now an example for you of figure 10.3, which is at the bottom of page 420, and figure 10.4, which is at the top of page 421, so that you can see a bar graph that is only representing one set of data, and then a bar graph that is representing two sets of data, and you can see how that is useful and lends itself to comparison between the two sets of data, okay? So let's pull that up for you to see. All right, hold on. My computer's having a little issue here. There we go. Okay, well, let's put up that bar graph for you to look at. All right, so here is the first one, and you can see that this is a bar graph that is telling us about total school expenditures over a period of time as per our definition from the year 2002 to the year 2009. We can tell that by the labels. Very important in any of the methods you choose to display that you label everything very clearly so that anyone reading your display can understand the data that is being represented. And then you can see here that our um, y-axis is representing billions of dollars. Now you will notice this little funny sign right here. This little funny sign that you see here at the bottom represents that this scale is being compressed. Why? Well, because for example, all scales start at zero, but you'll notice that it goes from zero to 400, but from then on, it's only going up by 50. 450, and then 500, 550. So what they're telling you is that from zero to 400, they have compressed the data so that you could better see the overall analysis. Also because most likely the data points that landed here, hmm, 
please excuse me, the data points that landed here are minimal and not many. And so it wasn't worth extending the scale here. But that's what this means. It means that the scale, the scale for this particular side of the graph has been compressed. Okay. So this is your typical bar graph. You'll note that there is the spaces between them. Um, but other than that, you can see the, the frequency of things. You can, see, you can see the trend of what's happening. You can see that school, uh, total school expenditures have increased as time has gone by, right? And it has definitely gone up. You can also tell that for the set of data that we're looking at, 2009 was the year the budget was the largest as far as school expenditures were concerned. Um, so you can see some data very quickly and easily and it becomes easy for you to view. Now, if we look here, we have the data of uh, two sets of data, okay? What we're looking at is school enrollment in thousands of students, but we wanna compare grades nine through 12, which you can see here is represented by the blue bars, and college level enrollment, which is being represented by the red bars. And we wanna compare them together to see if there's any relationship between how their enrollments are increasing individually and then over time. And you'll notice that they kind of keep pace with one another, right? Enrollments seem to be sort of keeping pace, although college enrollments are slightly higher in 1990. Then in 1995, it's slightly higher in high school. Uh, that continues in 2000. Then in 2005, they are both plateauing together. And in 2010, there was a big surge of college enrollment as compared to high school enrollment. So these things can, you know, can give you, uh, depending on how much more data you have, it also allows you to make some other conclusions. But those are some of the things that you can spot right away. And bar graphs lend themselves nicely to do this, where we can compare two sets of data um, side by side. Okay. So let's uh, go back to our notes here. All right, so now let's talk about that little note that I told you I was gonna mention in regards to histograms and bar graphs, okay? So they are very similar. In fact, we like to refer to histograms as being specialized versions of a bar graph, but there are some important differences to make note of. For example, histograms are always reported in this orientation, meaning that the intervals are reported along what we call the x-axis, and they are always in increasing order from left to right, and the frequency of the scores is always repent, uh, reported in the y-axis, and again, it always goes in increasing frequency from um, the bottom to the top. Bar graphs can be reported, um, can be oriented either way. We can choose to put our categories down here along the x-axis and have our frequencies here and have our bar graph setting vertically as we're accustomed. But there are bar graphs that have been done lying on their sides, I guess you can think of it, where we put our categories here on the right-hand side on what we normally ascribe to as the y-axis and we choose to put our frequencies along what we normally ascribe as our x-axis and then our bars are going horizontal. Either way is acceptable for a bar graph, but not for a histogram. So bear that in mind, okay? Now moving on to a line graph. Now, as I mentioned, bar graphs lend themselves to qualitative data, subjective data, things that we collect in categories like favorite ice cream, histograms, and the plot line, um, plot graphs, line plot graphs that we mentioned before. I'm oh, sorry, dot, dot. Uh, graphs and the stem and leaf plots that we mentioned before those were all um, more lend themselves more to qualitative data meaning measurable data that we measure objective data a line graph um, is also one that is best suited for qualitative data measurable data uh, numerical data and it's useful particularly for plotting things over time. It also is very useful for indicating trends. So you can, uh, it's great for predicting things. If you can use a line graph and you can see what's happening over time, you can predict what's going to happen beyond the time that you have analyzed. So it's a great predictive tool, um, particularly as to show trends over time. Um, and it, it's a, a, a great way of noticing whether things are increasing, decreasing, um, and if it's a straight line by constant rates so that you can tell whether it's decreasing or increasing by a rate of what. So it can be a very useful way of analyzing qualitative 
objective measurable data. And also, like the bar graph, lends itself to doing more than one set of data. We can do a single set or we can do multiple sets. Um, so I'm going to pull those up for you now so you can see them. And you're going to notice that we're going to do a compression again with the data there. But now you know how to recognize it, so it shouldn't be an issue. Okay, so let's look here. Here is a line graph uh, that is telling us about the average teacher salary, okay, as over time. And you can see that we have, um, we started in 2005 and they're plotting it out to 2011. Once again, you can see the little symbol here showing you they're compressing some of this data um, to fit the scale the way they want to report it, okay. Uh, you can see some of the notes I wrote here. We usually, we always, for line graphs particularly, we always put our input data on the x-axis and we always put our output data on the y-axis, okay? So input data being the thing that's always increasing, so it's generally time because line graphs are very useful for watching trends and um, of data over time. And then out here, our output data is usually what's the change that's happening as time increases. And you can see that in 2005, the average teacher salary was probably hovering at around 48,000. And now in 2011, the average teacher salary hovers at about 57,000. So although it is an increase of about $10,000, you will note that it does not um, match the workplace increase of many other careers. So teachers are still woefully underpaid, unfortunately. Um, but it's definitely a worthy career, so stick to it. All right, let's put that back here. And let's continue. Okay, so we have left off at line graphs. Now we want to move on to what's called a circle graph or a pie chart. Now circle graphs and pie charts are very much about qualitative data. We don't use them to report quantitative data. We use them to report qualitative data or to report what, what is called relative data. Why? Because circle graphs and pie charts are always um, reported in either fractions or percentages, okay? And a couple of things that you should know about circle graphs and pie charts is one, we always use them to compare parts to a whole, hence why it's always in fractions or percentages. Uh, two, the data must always be reported as fractions or percentages. And three, it is not just randomly assigned. The slices of that pie chart or that circle graph are not randomly assigned. That central angle that's being formed by that particular slice of that pie chart, it has to be proportional to the fraction or percentage of the 360 degrees that a circle must encompass is. So here's what we mean. For example, if I'm talking about 12% of the data that I wish to report in a circle graph or a pie chart, then the slice that I draw to represent that 12% of the data must be equal to 12% of 360. Or otherwise, the angle being formed has to be at a 43.2 degree angle, which we call a central angle. Okay, if I wanted to report one fourth of what's happening out of my data, then I would need to have that slice be equal to one fourth of the 360 degrees that is supposed to be encompassed by a circle, which as you know would be 90 degree central angle. All right, let me show you what I mean by looking at figures 10, 10, and 10, 11, which are both the top of page 425, so that you can more clearly understand what we're referring to here. Okay, so if you see here, um, here is the line graph where you can have multiple uh, sets of data that I forgot to mention earlier. Uh, you can see here how we've got um, age distribution, distribution of all teachers from 1971 to the year 2000, okay? And then here we're starting with teachers who started teaching under the age of 30 and then moving all the way over to over here, um, over the age of 50 and under the age of 30 is the um, the blue line plot and then we've got between the ages of 30 and 39 is the uh, red line plot and this tells us this is the percentage of teachers that fall into that age category uh, depending on what year we're talking about uh, between the ages of 40 and 49 starting in 1971 this is how many teachers percentage of teachers were in that age group 
okay, all the way out to 2006. And then obviously here is those who are in the age group of 50 and over, okay? So you can see how we in line plots lend themselves for multiple sets of data being reported simultaneously, and you can then compare them. All right, here is the pie chart that I was referencing. So if you see here, we have a pie chart that is representing the number of occupations that can be expected maybe in a particular city, town, neighborhood, community. And we're being told that teachers teaching in the K through 12 arena represent 12% of all the occupations in this particular community, right? So 12%, we have to specifically calculate it as this right here, this angle being formed here is what we call the central angle. And it needs to correspond to what 12% of 360 would be, okay? So we would calculate that, like I showed you in the notes, by finding what is 12% of 360. We find out that 12% of 360 is 43.2 degrees. So that is the size of the angle that must be created to represent this slice of 12% on this pie chart. So it is it has to be mathematically accurate to be an accurate pie chart. You cannot just randomly decide, I'm gonna make this slice bigger than that one because this percentage is slightly bigger than that than the other one. No, it has to match up with a central angle that is representational or proportional to the percent or the fraction that that slice is meant to represent. So I hope that's clear. If you've got any questions, feel free to email me and I'll try to clarify even more. Okay, we're almost nearing the end now, guys. Okay, so we finished talking about circle graphs, and now we're moving on to pictographs. Now, pictographs is the most common chart that's used for picturing data, and it's actually where we normally introduce graphing and statistical information to young children. Uh, we, can, we start pictographs even as early on as kindergarten and first grade. So it is usually the, your student's first foray into graphing, into visually representing data, and into understanding any kind of concept referring to statistics. And pictographs, as you can see here, are defined as using a picture or an icon to symbolize the quantity that is being represented. And again, the best way to see that is to look at figure 10, uh, 14 and on page 426, they're doing a pictograph there of housing, and it's just easier to understand what we mean when we look at one, okay? So here is a pictograph about the average number of home sales in a particular area, and they tell you pictographs must always tell you what the icon of the picture represents, and they tell you that one full little house represents 5,000 home sales. Now you can see here that in the year 2004, you would count all these full houses and multiply by 5,000. And then because you see there's a portion missing here, this is not a complete 500,000. This is probably like 400,080 or something to that effect, or 50, okay? So pictographs, this is a pictograph right here where the pictures represent the data and it's easy Again, to see where the data uh, climbs up, you can also still see which year had the highest home sales. You can also calculate those numbers very easily because once you know what each icon represents, then you just multiply by the number of icons that you see here. Um, but as you can see, pictographs only do not lend themselves for large sets of data um, because it would just be overwhelming. But it is a great way to introduce graphing is a great way of introducing the concept of data analysis and display, um, particularly to very young children. So um, that's why it's one of the most commonly used um, forms of data analysis, uh, visual display for data, okay? Now, because of the fact that you know, back in my day, a lot of these things had to be calculated by hand and then done by hand, nowadays you, there are so many um, computer programs and display uh, abilities that teachers have and all kinds of individuals have, that it is now more common to use what's called pictorial embellishments for the charts and graphs that you choose to use to display and organize your data. So if you see here on figure 1016 to 1018 on page 428, you have some great examples of pictorial embellishments. 
And so you can see here like this um, bar graph for all intents and purposes was meant to look like the um, Olympic flame bowl because this was supposed to uh, be a graph of the number of nations that were represented at the Olympics um, on different given years, okay? So that's what we call a pictorial embellishment. Here is a line plot that is intended to show the medium family income. And we've got these, this poor family hanging on to the line plot for dear life. Um, and here we have a pie chart that's intended to show the percentage of church giving. And you can see that they've embellished it by people are looking like an offering plate that you might see in a, at a church service. So this is what we call by pictorial embellishments to any one of the kinds of charts that we've discussed so far, okay? All right. Now, we also have what's called a scatter plot. Now, a scatter plot is when the data is being grouped into pairs of numbers that could or might not have a relationship between them. And so we have to put them on a plot and then make a determination to whether or not there is a trend there, whether or not there is a relationship between the two things that are being compared. Um, and um, I'm going to show you an example of one in a minute. But there's a couple of things we want to discuss about scatter plots, okay? And that is that once you make your scatter plot, you need to find, if possible, any particular pattern that exists between these number pairs. And to do so, you do so by finding what's called a regression line, okay? A regression line is defined as the straight line that best fits. And mind you, it's not going to fit well or a hundred percent because if it did then that would be a line plot and a line graph and not a scatter plot but you're going to look for a straight line that best fits the data and that represents the possible relationship that exists between the data points and then when you find that regression line you usually end up calculating what's called the correlation factor and what this correlation factor tells you is the factor by which the data fits the line and obviously the higher the correlation the better the fit, the better that line is predictive of what you can expect from these two things that are being plotted on your scatter plot. Uh, the lower that correlation factor is, then that means the less the data really fits that line, that regression line, and therefore that line is not going to be very accurate in assisting you in predicting the points and the relationship between the data points that you have put onto this scatter plot. Okay, so let me pull up these uh, last few uh, pictures because they make it a little easier to understand what a scatter plot looks like and what it's useful about it. Oops, sorry, clicked on the same thing. Let's try. Here we go. All right, so here is a scatter plot. And you can see the scatter plot is kind of all over. We are, this scatter plot in particular is looking at two point sets of data, correlation of two sets of data, the magnitude of earthquakes and the number of deaths caused by those particular earthquakes. So you can see here that there was a magnitude of an earthquake that was around 6. Point, I wanna guess that's like 6.2. And apparently the number of deaths were pretty close to zero. And again, you can see here that there is a bit of a compression, right? And then we look at here what I think looks like maybe a 6.4 or 6.3 magnitude of earthquake. And it looks like maybe there were several hundred deaths here, okay, caused by that particular um, earthquake. Now, what we want to know is whether or not there is a predictive regression line that might help us to be able to determine on average, what amount of deaths we can look for, uh, depending on the magnitude of an earthquake. The other thing is, what if there is no correlation? What if there's some other factor that is affecting the number of deaths uh, compared to the magnitude of a particular earthquake? Because for example, we have here an earthquake that was a 7.0 and apparently looks like almost zero deaths reported, but then we had an earthquake that was looked like maybe a 6.7 or a 6.8, and there were well over 2,500 deaths reported. What made the difference? So a scatter plot is going to tell us that we have these two things that we're trying to see whether or not there is a pattern or relationship between them, number of deaths after an earthquake and magnitude of that given earthquake. And if we can find a regression line with a strong correlation, then maybe we have found a relationship between these two things. Um, or say that they're correlated, like one is sort of leading to the other or is related to the other, 
or we might be able to determine that there is no correlation and there might be some other factors that have to be influencing um, these two things that we've put onto our scatter plot, okay? So if you look here, all right, they took a scatter plot of numbers of years of education as compared to how much income is being made. And they were able to find, here is the line of regression that they found. And it shows a relatively good um, correlation because you'll notice that most of our data points are pretty close to that line of regression. But it does also help us to spot some outliers, like someone who has well over uh, 13 years of education and yet is being such a low earner that it's way below 20,000. Or for example, someone here who has about 10 years of education and is earning nearly $100,000. So we know that these are outliers to our data set, but the rest seem to fit this line of regression rather well. So it looks like we have found that there is a significant relationship between the years of education that you have and the salary that you earn on a yearly outcome, okay? And so you can see here, they further analyze this by showing you some correlation that apparently if you've got about uh, 16 or 17 years of education, you can expect to be receiving about a $60,000 annual salary, okay? Um, and I think that they're including here your uh, high school and college years of education. So this is like, you know, from elementary on up. I don't think that these are all just higher years of education as in, uh, college and postgraduate because I'd be surprised if that was the case. Okay, so to wrap up our introduction to statistics, all right, we've looked at regression lines and correlations for scatter plots. And with that, my dears, we have completed our conversation or introduction of 10.1 into statistics and how to address statistical problems, how to um, let me see if I can get us back into full form here. Here we go. All right. So with that, we are done. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here because you don't need to see that anymore. All righty. And uh, the homework is listed on the Dropbox where you found the link to this video as well as the notes. It's also listed under your taskbar. It's homework number 22 and you will be completing for homework number 22, um, pages 431 to 434. Um, it's numbers one through 20, but you're going to do the odds. Uh, several of them have multiple parts, so do parts A through C um, as I've been assigning. On um, most of them, I think there's one or two where a one of the parts that falls between A through Z requires you to do their e-manipulative website. I don't want you to worry about that. So if that falls within A through C, you do not have to do that. I think there's two pieces there with that. Um, again, it is listed in this um, Dropbox link as well as the taskbar link. All right, and I hope that you have a wonderful day. All of this should be going live shortly before our normally scheduled one o'clock class, although we're not going to be having a live class, as you well know. All right, you guys have a great day.